You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. And this is London coming to you, of course, all over the world, thanks to the wonders of the internet. Now, it's a stripped down edition. I'm wearing gloves. As you can see, my normal tea service is no longer uh, available. Uh, some of our key staff are down, others are working from home, and a few of the hardiest of our people are through the glass, and I'm grateful to them. There'll be a medal at the end of this. Now, according to the BBC, Andrew Marr, this is not a time for outrage or jabbing of fingers. Well, I am brimful of outrage. I'm brimful of invective, of rebarbative questioning of the people in charge of our country in this emergency. And I think that's my job. You see, if they'd taken that point of view, in 1940, Chamberlain would have continued as the Prime Minister, and Hitler would already have been here. And we might even still be under the jackboot. It's precisely at a time of great national challenge, even existential challenge, that outrage and the jabbing of fingers is most required. Of course, we must all go forward together, but first we have to be sure we're going forward and not backwards, not veering off here only to veer over there later. Do you get my point? I have no confidence in Boris Johnson. If I was the leader of the opposition, I'd table it. It would lose in the House of Commons, and according to today's YouGov opinion poll, it would lose in the public opinion polls, but it would be right and it would later be proved to be right. It's important when you fundamentally disagree with someone or something that you say so, not hold your peace because you don't want to be accused of rocking the boat, because I believe our ship's captain is headed for the rocks. And it's my duty and responsibility to say so. Apparently, he's about to send me a letter. And everyone here listening, watching in Britain, you're all about to get a letter from Boris Johnson. It's going to cost the taxpayer £6 million. Now, I'm not sure what's going to be in the letter that couldn't be on the news on the television, on the radio. It's a very 20th century way of communicating, Boris, a letter, especially a letter from you. I hope you don't lick the envelope that comes to me because you've got coronavirus. And you've got it because while you were standing at a podium spouting your truisms that might not even be true, you were breaking the very things that you were spouting about even as we saw you speak. You were not two meters apart. And now your health minister and your chief medical officer for health are all down, all three of you, all down. And we saw the pictures of you in Downing Street, literally rubbing shoulders with each other. So I'm not sure I've got much to learn from you, Boris Johnson. I'm not sure that you know more than me, Boris Johnson. Especially as what you now claim to know is the opposite of what you did claim to know at the beginning. And who knows, may be different still from wherever it is you intend to go if the British death rate and infection rate continues to 
rise. So if I could play music on here, which I can't, it would be Elvis Presley's return to sender. So save the stamp, Boris. Don't send it to me because I've got no confidence that you have any idea of what you are doing. And I've just read an article in The Lancet, no less, you don't get any more gold-plated, blue-blooded, scientific, blue-ribboned, top-of-the-class than the Lancet. And I've just read there that they think you're making this all up as you go along. As Oscar Wilde might have put it, you are a sofa bearing the impression of whoever last sat upon you. That's the only conclusion I can reach. Now, I don't blame Boris Johnson or Donald Trump for the fact that this novel virus, this epidemic, pandemic, is cutting a knife through us. I don't blame you for that. Wherever that virus came from, and as you already know, I don't believe some of the things that you think you know about that, but time will tell. But I don't blame you for the fact that this virus has begun to cut this scythe through people all over the world. I blame you for the fact the doctors and the nurses have got no masks. <laughs> when I've got a mask, there are doctors and nurses at the front line, treating very sick people, very infectious people, people who may very well die from what they have without PPE. In some cases, with PPE that is out of date. In some cases, with PPE that went out of date in 2016, stamped over with a new false fake Date, we've got doctors going to builders, merchants, going to the shops that we go to for a sander or for a ladder to paint and decorate, to buy builders, protective masks. Doctors in a public health service on which we spend a huge sum but far from huge enough. I'm angry with you because we don't have enough ventilators. I'm angry with you that Germany has got five times more ventilators than us and whose death rate is very considerably fewer, less than us. I'm blaming you because we don't have enough intensive care beds in our hospitals. I'm blaming you for the fact that our health service is in such a parlous condition that they're building a morgue in the Excel conference center in the East End of London, so large, a kilometer long, and they think they may have to fill it with dead people. I'm blaming you for the fact that our health service, paramedics, emergency workers have been so undervalued, underpaid, understaffed for so long that they may be overwhelmed if this huge rate of increase in the number of deaths continues. When I say you, I don't actually mean you personally. I mean you as the Prime Minister. I mean you as the leader of the Conservative Party. And I mean you as a part of the Conservative Labour coalition, which has governed Britain for 40 years, for the neoliberal orthodoxies that you have peddled and followed. Some Labour supporters don't like me to put it that way. But if you think this crisis all began 
with the election of David Cameron in 2010, that's only because you're not looking. That's only because you are averting your eyes. I made a film called The Killings of Tony Blair. Check it out. You'll see the way that the Blair and Brown government paved the way for everything that has happened since, not just in wars, but in the war against the public realm that we treasured and which transformed our lives, certainly transformed mine in the brief historic period between 1945 and 1979, which I go on believing was a golden age for our people and for our country. And if it's bad in Britain, well, the United States now has the most coronavirus patients in the world. It has a death rate that is truly frightening in the steepness of its escalation. And it has a president who literally goes on television and says to governors of states of the union that because they weren't nice enough to him, because they didn't appreciate enough what he had been doing for them, they would not be getting any more help. New York is the epicenter of the American end of the pandemic. Its governor, Andrew Cuomo, has risen to the occasion. And here's a prediction. He'll be the Democratic Party's nominee for president on the principle that he isn't Bernie Sanders and you cannot be serious about letting Joe Biden, sleepy, creepy Joe, out in November against Donald Trump. Last time round in 2016, the US Democrats put up the only candidate in America who could have lost to Donald Trump. In 2020, if they put up Joe Biden, they'll be doing exactly the same again. But back to my earlier point. It's not that I'm outraged by the individuals. How could one be outraged by Tony Hancock? Who is he? Who is he? What has he ever done? He's like a, a character from, from The Office on TV, selling paper clips or photocopying paper. It's not these tiny, small, mediocre individuals against which I'm outraged. I'm outraged at the system that produces them and puts them here today, gone tomorrow, in their places of managerial power, they call it, laughingly. It's really a temporary control that they have. You see, for me, times of existential crisis, like the Second World War, like this pandemic, prove that the prevailing economic, political, social system in the world is not fit for purpose. How could it be? If you believe that an that a, 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 an unsentient, a, a, unalive economic political system where no humans are involved, just the dead hand, the unseen hand of the market of profit and loss, supply and demand. If you believe that such a nebulous method of social organization is the best that we can do, well, a crisis like this proves that it isn't. Just like in 2008, the private banks had to be bailed out by public money, so now Richard Branson always defends himself from the charge that he's become way too rich 
by telling us that he is a risk-taking entrepreneur. Well, he took a risk. He gambled. It didn't work. He has to go bust. Of course, the country, the state, should take over the planes, the routes, should take over the staff, the employment of the people that work for Richard Branson. But the idea that we're going to give public money to a risk-taking entrepreneur whose risk went wrong is simply berserk. Why would you do that? Why would you allow a man who's wrecked the trains, who's sued the National Health Service when he didn't get awarded a multi-billion pound contract, why would you give a man who lives on his own private Caribbean island precisely to avoid paying tax in Britain, why would you give him public money? You're going to give it to Sir Philip Green, who's closed his top shop chain, who's stopped making payments to the pension fund. Remember him? Remember pension funds? The man who's walked away from all his responsibilities and who lives on a yacht in Monte Carlo precisely to avoid paying tax in Britain. You're going to bail him out? Let's bail none of them out. Let's learn the lesson this time. The lesson we should have learned in 2008. That it's not true that public is good but private is better. It's not true because it's only private in the good times. In the bad times, we, the public, have to pick them up off the floor. I'm outraged at the idea that blind forces should be entrusted with our national destiny and even in this case, the lives of our people, all of our people. You see, in the Second World War, to which I return in conclusion of my monologue, we didn't leave the market to decide who got potatoes and who got coal and who got butter, who got cheese, who got eggs. How could we? If the soldiers at the front knew that their wives couldn't feed their children because a rich person bought all the eggs and all the bread, couldn't keep their house warm because a rich person bought all the coal, do you think the men at the front would have carried on fighting? No. Because at a time of grave danger to the country, there's no room for profiteering. There's no room for hoarding. There's no room for such injustice as undermines the national morale. These are the fingers that I jab. This is the outrage in which I believe. And you have every opportunity, by phone, by tweet, even by email, to let me have your point of view. I've got a poll up and running already. How is your government handling the crisis? A, well. B, badly. C, moderately. Here's the numbers. A, well, 28%. B, badly, 45%. C, moderately. 27%. Get your votes in now on my Twitter feed. I'll be joined momentarily by one of the best guests ever on this show and on any show for that matter. He's Professor Richard Wolf. He's a professor of economics. He's the author of Understanding Socialism. He's the host of Economic Update, co-founder of Democracy at Work Info. And I'm going to be talking to him, not just about the health impact of the coronavirus, but of the political and economic impact too. Because the United States, even less inclined towards 
socialism than British governments are, has had to throw in something like six trillion, T, trillion dollars into the US economy uh, in order to forestall economic collapse, they hope. But most people believe, and I suspect that Professor Wolf does, that the throwing of trillions of dollars at private corporations, the bigger and richer the corporation, the more stimulus it gets, will be used overwhelmingly for these corporations to buy back their own stock to make their uh, leading shareholders all the richer and that the impact of the helicopter money, which Trump has also sent out, something like $1,000 per adult, something like $500 per child, that that helicopter money will not go far. And when the private landlords come evicting, as they undoubtedly will in not many months from now, as the private banks come foreclosing on people with mortgages, and as is happening now, by the way, already in Italy, where the poor have run out of money and run out of food, we may see serious trouble in the United States. We may see serious trouble in Italy and in Spain, where the sharpness of the criticism of the system and the power is now reaching razor sharp quantities, qualities, properties. So, Professor Maestro, tell us what's happening in the United States. Start off, if you would, with the health aspects, and then we'll talk about the economic and the political impact of all this, if you would. I'd be glad to, George. Let me uh, start this way. Uh, we are in the early aggressive growth stage of the virus. Uh, that is, the statistics are terrifying. Every day, more and more uh, cases. Every day, more and more deaths. Um, and we're just at the beginning as I assume you know, but in case you don't, uh, we have allowed under the regime of neoliberalism for 30 to 40 years now, uh, we have allowed hospitals to be closed. We have allowed public health services of all kinds to be either eliminated or under, underfunded. Um, it, because it was not profitable for private enterprises here in the United States uh, to produce uh, testing equipment or ventilators or face masks or any of the other necessary equipment to handle a viral pandemic, we didn't have any. Nor did the government, which is committed to private profit enterprise as its highest priority, anyway, nor did the government compensate for the failure of the private enterprises to do it. I understand that's how capitalism works. There's no profit in producing uh, masks and test kits and ventilators um, if you can't sell them. There's no profit in stockpiling them for a year or longer uh, as the precaution uh, would require. Uh, and so they didn't. And the government didn't step in and make it happen. The government didn't compensate for the failure of the private system. So we were woefully underprepared. And if you add to that an extremely right wing government, even more hesitant to do anything that even vaguely resembles criticizing uh, private capitalism uh, for this sort of failure. Uh, then you understand that the Trump administration did nothing, which means that as the virus got here, somewhat later, two or three months later than it got uh, to China, 
a month or so later or 12, maybe six weeks later than it got to Italy and Iran. But it got here and we have now surpassed the number of cases in China so that we are in a new way a number one society, only it's number one in virus cases. The hospitals are overwhelmed. In New York City, where I lived until I left a week ago, because it is too dangerous to live in New York City. Uh, let me underscore that for your listeners uh, and viewers around the world. Tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people have left New York City for an indeterminate length of time because it is the center of the virus, at least now, in the United States. There are trucks, they are called refrigerator trucks, parked on the streets of New York City that are functioning as special extra morgues. They're cold and so they can hold dead people who have died because of the coronavirus since the regular morgues cannot handle them since it is forbidden to have a funeral because it gathers people together and that's a transmission mechanism to make all of these gory details get to their central point we have a health disaster of the highest proportions in the united states cities like new york and many of the other cities are now referred to as ghost cities because there are very few people on the street, everybody is at home, everybody is terrified, and not the least because the government of the United States is literally not believed, and I mean this literally. What comes out of Mr. Trump's mouth is not believed by at least 60% of the American people. Uh, the other 40% apparently, although it's a little hard to be sure, still do believe in him. So let me get then to the point you made. Mr. Trump is facing a political disaster. The evidence of his failure to act, his recorded debunking and mocking of the virus as late as middle February of this year, mean that he is threatened in his reelection. Our election is scheduled for early November of this year. He is in danger because of the health disaster. But the health disaster has now morphed or expanded, or maybe I should say metastasized, into an economic disaster as well. The unemployment officially 10 days ago was 280,000 people. Uh, four days ago, it had ridden to 3,300,000, and we are probably losing jobs here at the rate of a quarter of a million additional unemployed every day with no end in sight. Therefore, his election is doubly threatened first by a health crisis for which he has major responsibility, and then for an economic crisis which derives from the, the virus, and again from the failure of the government, since absolutely no program of preparing the country or of coping with the country in its economic collapse has so far been shown to exist. The only thing being done, and I mean this literally, is a massive creation of money thrown into and at the economy. Half of it literally created out of nothing by our central bank, the Federal Reserve, and the other half an increase in government spending that presumably will be funded by more government borrowing. And let me remind you, one of the reasons the virus is having devastating economic effects 
is because the response of American capitalism to the dot-com crash in early 2000 and to the subprime mortgage crisis, so-called, which crashed uh, capitalism in 2008 and 9, the response to that was, again, throwing money at the problem, reducing interest rates to zero or even below. And what that did is it made every government, every corporation, and most of our people solve all of their problems over the first two decades of the 21st century by borrowing money. Therefore, the government of the United States is deeper in debt, as I'm speaking, than it has ever been. Corporate America is deeper in debt than it has ever been. And the people of this country are deeper in debt than they have ever been. The mass of people have four kinds of debt, all of which are at or near record amounts. Mortgage debt to buy homes, automobile debt to buy cars, uh, what we call revolving debt or credit card debt to cover their ongoing expenses, and the big new one, student debt, which we never had before, which is now uh, at or near the same level as credit card debt, uh, we're talking trillions of dollars. So the economy is weakened by sitting literally atop a debt bubble, all of which was created not just by Mr. Trump, but by his predecessors as well. He apparently has concluded, however, that he is still going to try to get reelected. The man doesn't know any other way to proceed. And since he can't do much about the uh, virus, that cat is out of the bag. He's decided he's going to try to posture. And that's what it is. It's, this is all theater. The, the Trump administration is a theatrical production. It has been from the beginning, and it continues to be. The theater now is he has demanded, insisted, uh, that we will all go, I quote you now, back to work on or about Easter time. That is on or about April 10 to 12. He has asked for the churches to be packed. Uh, this is a man who, to anyone's knowledge, in the first 70 years of his life, never set foot in a church, <laughs> has had no relationship of any sort in a church, has a personal behavior, I was about to say, that is not church-like, but we all know what, what that's all about. But in any case, um, he, is going, he wants the churches to be packed. Within hours of his saying so, the uh, Roman Catholic hierarchy of the United States, the cardinals and archbishops that run the diocese from New York uh, to Los Angeles to Houston, uh, announced uh, that their churches will be closed on Easter, the exact opposite of pact. Uh, but he is forcing, because he is desperate, uh, a choice on the American people. Uh, and I mention it not only to understand our dire circumstances here, but I suspect that other leaders uh, I'm thinking of Bolsonaro in Brazil and possibly your own favorite, uh, Mr. Johnson, and so on, may take some clues from this, uh, or cues is better the word I want. He is going to force employers and employees to make a remarkable choice. Are they going to go back to work in crowded work conditions? Are they going to go back into the department stores and other shuttered enterprises where there will be large crowds, thereby risking the spread of the disease that every responsible epidemiologist and doctor has told the population not to do? Or are they going to refuse to work? and to refuse to shop. In an ironic twist, George, that I know you and many of your listeners will appreciate, 
Mr. Trump is creating the conditions under which an enormous number of Americans are going to engage in within two weeks in what is in effect a general strike because they will not do in large numbers. How large? Nobody knows. What is being demanded of them because they think it risks their lives, which it does. Why would he do such a thing? Because he's desperate. He cannot win re-election being the president who failed to prepare for the virus, who failed to ready the economy for the virus, who failed to prevent the economy from becoming an even worse problem than the virus itself. itself. There is one way, Richard, uh, that he could win, and that is if his opponent is wandering around being captured on camera as being no longer actually with us, <laughs> alive, but no longer sentient. His thoughts no longer connected to his words. His skeletons tumbling out of the cupboard. That is one way he could be elected if the Democrats put up sleepy, creepy Joe. <laughs> yes, you're, you're quite right. I, I, I hesitate to let my brain go in that direction, not because your argument isn't persuasive, it is, uh, but because I need, as an American, desperately to hold on to the idea that people will see, despite Mr. Biden, that they cannot return into office um, so grotesquely insensitive, incompetent, unjust bully as they have. I mean, the story of Italy in its worst moments three or four weeks ago, turning to the Chinese government, asking for help and getting uh, plane loads of Chinese doctors and nurses and frontline workers to help in Italy, as they have done, is a stunning contrast to the nationalist turn of Mr. Trump, who has no relationships with anybody, has asked the Chinese for nothing, took time out last week to attack Mr. Maduro in Venezuela yet again, uh, even as the situation here falls apart, it is my hope that you could put Humpty Dumpty up against <laughs> Mr. Uh, Trump and pull out a win bec because it really isn't anymore a matter of getting the right person. The right persons have all been uh, pushed out of the running by the centrists, as they like to call themselves, that still control the Democratic Party, the Clintons, the Obamas, all of that. Um, and they're going to do whatever they think is necessary to capture a government back from Mr. Trump. And they're going to use the argument, no matter who they pick, the only argument they have, since they are as responsible as anybody for this mess we're in, they're going to use the, the, the argument, anything is better than Trump. And we are the only option uh, that has a chance, therefore vote for us. I should remind you that Mr. Trump got in because people were so disgusted with the conditions of the United States that they voted first in the Republican Party against the old traditional party people, and then in the general election against the traditional old party people in the Democratic Party, they wanted something new. Obama ran on the slogan, hope and change. Mr. Trump was change because he acted in so grotesque a way. Bernie Sanders could have and would have inherited the mantle of something changed, something different. And my view is, even before the virus hit, but particularly since they would, the American voters would have turned to him because like Obama was different because he was black and Trump was different because he was outrageous. 
Bernie Sanders would have been different because he accepts the label socialist. And as I could tell you, America is changing dramatically. A clear majority of people 35 years of age and under now say in poll after poll that they prefer socialism to capitalism. If I could add one thing, the so-called rescue program that was uh, produced and signed into law over the last three or four days is a classical Keynesian, that's in honor of, of your Lord Keynes there, uh, a Keynesian throw the money again as they did in 2008 and nine. I want to remind everyone doing what they're doing, dropping interest rates virtually to zero, throwing huge amounts of money into the economy. What it produced was an, a serious increase in the already hobbled debt dependence of the American economy. It worsened the inequality of income and wealth. It made it easier for the tiny minority at the top uh, not only to accumulate unheard of amounts of wealth, but also to use a good portion of it to literally buy 90% of the political system and force it into this kind of behavior. And it also impoverished the mass of people. It is now a staple of both Republican and Democratic Party campaigns to bemoan the end and the loss of the so-called American dream and of the so-called American middle class. They're, they're not left. And the mockery of this latest bill is to say to an over-indebted, anxiety-ridden uh, working class, we're going to give you $1,200, mm. which will not carry them through two to three weeks of a barely minimal life. Um, it is beyond words, but for someone like me, and I guess it's for you too, George, we are experiencing the consequently rapid radicalization of politics in the United States. No one was prepared for this. All the conventional politicians were caught flat-footed unaware, unprepared, way out of their depth. And the people of this country are looking in all directions, left, right, you name it, for new directions, new leadership, uh, and being cooped up in your home, as we all are, is making all of this go very fast. You're right. And that was a quite stupendous tour of the horizon in the United States. I knew that nobody could do it better. You didn't disappoint. Professor Richard D. Wolf, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, Alex, uh, on the other hand, says USA deaths per one million of the population, seven. Italy deaths per one million of the population, 178. Seems the USA is doing great under Trump. I wonder if you still think that, Alex, having heard Richard Wolf for the last 20 minutes or so. Mary Blair says, sending out a letter to tell us what has already been said on air. What a waste of money. A bit like Cameron's letter, re-Brexit, waste of money. And Paddy says, tackling a deadly virus with our NHS wearing pound shop equipment and crowdfunding for supplies whilst Bozo sends out his propaganda leaflets. And YouTube comments, uh, Tarek Al-Sulbi, let's talk about the media and how it's giving our elderly anxiety. And Gold Inc. says, who cares about Israel? Care about our own problems. Palestine's biggest problem is their own leaders. Fact. Though all the prize goes to you, uh, Gold Inc., for the biggest non-sequitur of the evening. Uh, Emily Cavendish says, I frankly don't care about things which poorly informed people erroneously believe to be a real nation state. In reality, there is no such thing as Palestine. Who's talking about it, Emily? Ivan Dignan says, talk about the money, George, the crash, 
Lol, there's no money. No one can get bailed out. Remy Cherry says, anyone else here believe the virus was leaked from that virology lab in Wuhan? Well, that is a possibility. Uh, it's also a possibility it could have been leaked from that virology uh, lab, that germ warfare uh, enterprise in the United States now closed. Uh, Ethical Revolution says virus and superbugs come from animal farms, just like Spanish flu originated in Kansas. Next one is bird flu from the 65 billion chickens bred and killed each year. And Planetary Citizen says, I want to know when we get the self-testing kits to see if we have the virus. Good point. Must be trouble, says, I don't think you just realize a virus without the vaccine. Coronavirus either just naturally mutated or accidentally escaped. And emails. Tony says, Trump's bailout will cost around six trillion in total. How long until we're talking about quadrillions? Are quadrillions even a thing? I've never heard that word before. Jim says, my wife is a senior registrar in York Hospital. She told me that there are many doctors and nurses becoming infected by the virus in hospital and she's getting worried about her own health. She said one of the reasons the infection rate is so high within the hospital is because doctors and nurses from departments that are not directly dealing with COVID-19 patients are not allowed to use face masks to protect themselves. She said this decision is to be made uh, is made by the hospital trust management, not the healthcare professional, because there isn't enough PPE available to give to everyone. Well, God bless your wife, uh, Jim, and all her colleagues. I may say that the Lancet article to which I referred at the beginning of the show was so damning that it called for, amongst many other things, the resignation of every single healthcare trust in this country. And later we'll be asking Dr. Ranji why exactly we need healthcare trusts. Uh, Tony says, where has the UK taxpayers money gone? Our NHS is crippled, our infrastructure ancient, woeful. And here's some poll replies. How's the poll doing, by the way? Uh, okay, well, A, how's your government handling the crisis? A, well, 32%, B, Badly, 45%. C, moderately, 23%. Don't forget, we'll be talking to Dr. George, John Campbell uh, right after the break. Anyway, Paul replies. Paul, living in Auckland, New Zealand, into our fifth day of lockdown. Glad to have a competent, kind leader in Jacinta Ardern. She's done a fantastic job so far. And Ali Ansari says, millions of Indians stranded as a result of poor planning before the country went into a sudden lockdown. Migrant workers having to walk hundreds of kilometers to get home while others starve from lack of essential supplies. Thousands gathered at transport hubs, increasing the risk of corona spread. And on Twitter, Jason Mots, sorry, Jason Mots, M-O-T-Z. As a Canadian, I have never been happier to live north of the USA. As much as I love UK pop culture, I wouldn't swap my healthcare today with yours, not even for a date with Simone Marie Butler. Some of the younger lads can let me know who she is. Uh, YouTube comments, Ant H says, coronavirus is project fear on track. And Osman says, George doesn't believe coronavirus is a hoax. Nah, I really don't believe it's a hoax, Osmond. I mean, just how many people dying, how many people suffering, how many doctors and nurses crying into your camera do you need before you drop this unhinged disease of libertarian conspiracy theories? Really, I despair at you. Well, welcome back. I've got my tea. Hope you've got yours. Here's the poll. How is your government handling the crisis? A, well, 31%, down one. B, badly, 46%, up one. C, moderately, 23%. 1,105 of you have voted. 
It's about time you did. You can vote on my Twitter feed. Now, I have any minute now, Dr. John Campbell, retired nurse teacher and a &E nurse uh, on the line. Uh, and we'll be talking to him about this coronavirus issue. I just want to read out the uh, latest numbers. <clears throat> Most coronavirus cases. The United States, 124,697. Italy, 92,472. China, 81,439. Spain, 78,000. 797. Germany, 58,137. France, 37,611. Iran, 35,408. The United Kingdom, 17,136. Switzerland, 14,352. Belgium, 10,836. The Netherlands, 9,819. South Korea, 9,583. Austria, 8,291. Turkey, 7,402. Canada, 5,607. Portugal, 5,170. Norway, 4,040. Eight. Is Dr. John on the line? Dr. John Campbell, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, tax your expertise a bit uh, on one or two uh, aspects. Um, but start off, please, by telling us how you'd vote in my poll and why. That's a very good question, George. Now, the, the reaction of my government and indeed governments around the world and indeed the World, world Health Organization has been one of varying their tune as they've gone along. So a lot of people started off reasonably badly and then they've got gradually better as time goes on. So the whole problem is really that world governments and a lot of leaders have been reactive rather than proactive. They're reacting to the situation that they find themselves in rather than anticipating the situation and working ahead about it. Now, if you'd asked me that question about a month ago, I would say the answer was it's quite abysmal, that we're not taking anything like enough precautions, that we're not taking this seriously enough, that they don't really understand what the word pandemic means. They might be able to write it down on a blackboard, but pandemic, what it really means for the people, the death and the suffering and the disruption that causes. I just don't think they got it. And if we looked at people in Parliament, not just not, not, not just the UK Parliament, but anywhere in the world, people were still close together, they were still shaking hands. They just weren't weren't getting it. But for the last week or two since we've had the lockdown, I think now the government really understands. I think the penny has dropped. I think the message has got through. And the way we're handling it now is really getting quite a lot better with this lockdown. But there's still a lot of things we can improve. And the big thing that's missing in the UK response, although it's there now and it's starting today with the drive through testing for NHS staff, is just that, testing. We need massively more testing. So we're suppressing this epidemic, this pandemic from on the top, but we need to pick away at it from the bottom by specific testing, by isolating every case, by quarantining all of the contacts of that case. Then we can have a much more surgical approach rather than this blanket top-down approach that we're using. But right now, I'd say they're trying really hard. Boris has ordered three and a half million tests, which is a great start. We're going to need a lot more than that. But I think now the government has got its bit between its teeth. It realises this is a serious global problem and it's actually doing quite well as of the last week. Why do you think so many people, including watching and listening to this show now and, write, <coughs> and writing in, uh, simply don't believe it? Uh, they think that, uh, uh, and the more, let me talk at the, the, the more respectable end of that kind of attitude, would be the Daily Mail journalist Peter Hitchens, uh, who doesn't uh, deny that the virus exists, who regrets every death that it causes, but insists that a significant number, perhaps two-thirds or more than two-thirds, of the people who died in the last three months in Britain would have died this year anyway. 
Uh, I don't think that's accurate. I mean, the, 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 the coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease, we know is exacerbating other conditions and is more dangerous in other conditions. And we know that the older people they are, are, older people are, the more likely they are to die if they get this condition because they're going to get complications from it. But these are people that could have lasted for many years into the future. We simply don't know that. So it seems like there's a bit of denial going on here. This is a virus that makes people very sick and can cause acute conditions. So, for example, of all the people that get it, while we're grateful that most people, about 80%, get a fairly mild illness, we know there's about 12% or some studies say 14% of people that get really quite ill with this, up to the point where they might need some medical intervention, such as additional oxygen, such as intravenous antibiotics, such as intravenous fluids. But we also know there's about 5% of people get critically ill with it. And this is what is causing the death of these people. And without a lot of intervention, then the case fatality rate will rise. And we know there's a case fatality rate in this. In Italy, we've seen a horrendous case fatality rate. It's been round about, well, some of the figures work out at 9 or 10%. Now, we don't believe it's anything like that high. The chief medical officer still believes that round about 1% is a nearer figure. But you can't argue with the science that of 100 people that get this infection, about one of them is going to die. That is just simple epidemiological science. That's simple maths. And to not deny that is, it's a bit like being in the Flat Earth Society or something. It is. A lot of them are Flat Earth uh, types. Uh, and uh, it's a fad. Extinction Rebellion, Flat Earth. Uh, and now uh, deniers of the coronavirus. However, <coughs> however the, the, the percentage of people who die is only quantifiable if you know how many people have got it. And you can't know how many people have got it until you have either randomly tested the whole population or actually tested everybody in the population. And in other words, uh, if 10 out of every 100 that you have tested are dying, you've got a 10% death rate. But if, if there's another 1,000 times more people that have never been tested but may have it, yep. uh, then the proportion of people who die from it is very much smaller, isn't it? Absolutely, George. The case fatality rate can only be accurately calculated at the end of an epidemic when you're looking back retrospectively. Only at the end, then, will you have an antibody test so you can see how many people have had it. So if we look at the horrendous death rate in Italy at the moment, which has been around about 10 percent, well, we know that's actually dropped quite a bit in the last few days because Italy have instigated much larger scale testing and they're testing many, many more people. So as they test more and more people, there's a great greater denominator at the bottom and the, the death rate looks relatively smaller in terms of percentage yeah. in terms of case fatality rate but given having said that the the Chinese Center for Disease Control did do a study of about 72,000 people who were diagnosed positive in China and did come to figures round about this 1% mark and also as well as that in South Korea where there's very extensive testing very advanced testing again that the figures are working out at round about 1% because of the large large amount of testing. And again, in Germany, because there's been a large amount of testing, the case fatality rate there does appear to be lower. But you're absolutely correct. I mean, how many people in the UK have got uh, COVID-19 infection now? The answer to that question is we simply don't know. It's likely to be at least 10 times the official figure. And some people say it could be a million or well over a million. Now, if that's the case, the case fatality rate is going to be greatly lower. But there's a big proviso here in that people have got probably an incubation period of, say, a week on average. It can be two to 14 days. And then they're sick for a week or two. And only usually in the second week do people develop severe complications. So typically, someone is not going to die until two, three, four, or even five or six weeks after the onset of symptoms. So there's a big lag in the amount of deaths. So when the amount, total amount of deaths are counted up in a few weeks' time, it is going to be higher. But there again, when we do more testing, we're going to know what the numbers are and it's going to be higher. But we're never going to know, going to know the true fatality rate until we do this antibody test. You probably know there's two sorts of testing. There's the antigen test, which tests for the presence of the virus. Is someone infected now? And there's the antibody test. And I believe we're getting a lot of those quite soon that shows where the virus has been. It's testing for the immune protein that the virus has made in people's blood. And that will tell us who has had it.
And it's only, as you rightly say, when we test the antibodies of everyone in the country, know how many total cases there are, and then compare that to the total number of deaths that will have the accurate case fatality rate. But the current estimate of 1%, I'm afraid, might not be too far out at the end of the day when we calculate these final figures in a few years' time. Of course, if it's, if it's your mother or my mother uh, that <coughs> dies from it, they're 100% dead and we've 100% lost yeah. them. So I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, where uh, some of these conspiracy theorists are coming from because a lot of people's mothers have already died and they might well, as you say, have lasted another year, two, five more oh, yeah. uh, years. Uh, yeah. And there's a remarkable, uh, I don't know, equanimity uh, with which these things are uh, viewed. It's, it's, it's funnily enough, people who think of themselves on the left but are positively Malthusian uh, in, their, uh, in their willingness to see the, the elderly, the weak, the infirm uh, go to the knacker's yard. But what do you say to this point, Doctor? The, uh, there's a difference between someone dying with coronavirus and someone dying from coronavirus. In other words, coronavirus may have been the tipping point, perhaps, uh, but so many other conditions, weaknesses, underlying problems existed in that patient uh, that the coronavirus is only one of the factors. Yes. So if people die with coronavirus, that by definition means it is an acute illness because someone will contract the virus. The virus will multiply inside their body and then they'll get clinical features about a week later. And the virus is going to be detectable for a few days before they get clinical symptoms. Indeed, it's going to be transmissible for a few days before they get symptoms. And then the virus is going to be present in appreciable numbers for about eight days after that. So what that means, most people are only going to have an infectious dose of the virus for about 10 days. So if people die with coronavirus, there's only a 10, 10 day window in that time. So it's very likely that that virus has been the actual facilitating cause or the actual precipitating cause of their death. It's not like saying prostate cancer where you can have it for 10 or 20 years before it kills you and people die with it rather than from it. I believe these people are dying primarily from coronavirus and COVID-19 disease. And you know, th th to me, this is an absolutely central point because what is it that makes a society civilized? You know, to, to me, civilization is defined by the way it looks after the weaker members of that society. And wh wh while in epidemiology and this sort of study, we do have to talk about numbers, and that's necessary to have that objectivity and talk about numbers. But at the same time, we have to remember as, as nurses and doctors that these are human beings. As, as anyone, we have to remember that they're human beings. And as a society, I judge the, the, the advancement of a society and the civilization of a society by how it treats its weakest members. And uh, we need to look after our weakest members of our society. But having said that, I think our government is doing that now with this lockdown. So this is very encouraging. They're no longer seen as expendable. The initial policy of the government where we were going to go for herd immunity would have involved horrendous losses. And just thank goodness that they actually changed that. And they changed that based on modeling from Imperial College London. Although, so, although Imperial have uh, uh, Apache record, according to uh, Professor at Edinburgh University, I'm quoting him, I think, accurately, uh, and uh, the Oxford University study uh, gives uh, a different picture, and Imperial themselves now say uh, that the 250,000 figure of likely deaths in Britain uh, can now be expected to be around 20,000, in other words, one-tenth or less than uh, mm -hmm. of what they originally said. Is there, yeah. a, is there a danger that, that we could be following a policy based on flawed uh, analysis statistics? There's always that danger, but Imperial College uh, are actually using accepted epidemiological techniques and they are a, they are a centre of the World Health Organisation as well. And of course, that's a completely separate debate as to how the World Health Organisation organization have done in this. But th what, what they have is very sophisticated mathematical epidemiological models. And these have been developed quite extensively actually over the past 20 years.
but they're based on the influenza virus. But having said that, the transmissibility of the influenza virus and the COVID-19 coronavirus is fairly similar. And in fact, the coronavirus is more transmissible than, than the influenza virus under usual conditions. So the modeling they're using, uh, the, the models they use are fairly sophisticated. And that initial data that showed that there was going to be a horrendous amount of death is one reason why the government changed its changed its, its strategy. And I believe this new 20,000 figure that Imperial are now talking about takes into account the lockdown and anticipates the increase in testing that's going to happen. But it's still sobering to note that 20,000 is probably the minimum amount of deaths that the government is anticipating. So I think we have to be based on science, George, because if we're not based on science, we're based on opinion and subjectivism. And we have to be as objective as we can and we have to go with the evidence that we've got and I, I do see that has happened to some extent. And I really believe the strategies that we're following now of the lockdown and the way we reduce the social interactions, we know that does greatly increase the transmissibility of the virus. Not that it changes the transmissibility of the virus itself, of course, it doesn't change the biology of the virus. But what we have to remember is this virus can only live inside the human respiratory tract. It can only multiply inside human cells. And if we physically separate those human beings, we deny the virus the opportunity to transmit. That, that therefore we break up its lifestyle and stop it from transmitting. And this is what we've seen with the reduction in number in China, the, the stabilization of the numbers and reduction of numbers in South Korea, and, and again in Taiwan, and to some extent in Hong Kong, although Hong Kong have backslidden a bit lately as the, uh, some of the restrictions have been, have been reduced. What about this uh, last point, Doctor, and I'm grateful for your time. Pleasure. Uh, a, a few of the lads in the office this evening uh, by the grace of God, uh, have not had any corona symptoms, but they're going nuts. They're going mad, uh, cut off from uh, life, uh, stuck in their houses. Uh, some of them unmarried, some of them champing at the bit. Uh, there, there is, there is a, a, a mental health cost as well as a societal cost. And of course, not to mention a gigantic economic cost oh, yeah. uh, from uh, this period of <clears throat> lockdown and isolation, isn't there? You're absolutely right, George. I mean, technically, at the moment, you can't take your girlfriend for a walk if she doesn't live in the same household. Quite. It, it, it really is. Th th these, these implementations are quite draconian. But they are based on this epidemiology. But we have to remember that people are body, soul, mind, spirit. We, we are eclectic, holistic beings. And we, we just have to be so aware of the anxiety, the stress, the mental, the mental stress. I mean, for example, I'm on record as, as saying that uh, there'll be an increase in birth rate in December, which is nine months from now, of course. And there'll also be an increase in things like, I, I regret to say, probably domestic violence, divorce. All, all sorts of problems with people being forced to stay in the household. And for young people, especially, as you say, you're chomping at the bit. They want to get out. They want to be doing things. They want to be living the lives. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult for them. And we really have to come together and support each other in this and realize that everyone is in the same position. And this cost is immense. But the alternative is a cost which is probably even higher, and that is many, many people will die. And this can include young people as well, because although the probability of death increases with comorbidities, although the probability of death increases with increasing age, we still get some tragic cases of young fit people oh, yeah. with no comorbidities that get this and die. This tragic case of the ENT surgeon, for example, who, who died uh, today uh, after working in an A&E department, um, I don't know. We don't know why young fit people sometimes die, but they sometimes do. So the, the, the balance is, are we going to put up with this confinement for what, what may turn out to be a good few months, to be quite honest? Or are we going to risk uh, the individual's death going out? And as they come into other contact with other people and come into contact with vulnerable people, the almost certain risk of quite a few of the vulnerable people they're going to come into contact with. So it's a really difficult equation. I don't pretend to have the answer, but what I do know is we need to support each other through it, understand our anxieties, understand our frustrations and communicate. Human beings are communicators and we have to come alongside people allegorically, even if we can't come alongside them physically and really support people as much as we can through this. So make that call, make, make that internet connection, make that Facebook friend and just make people feel included that we're all going through this together because we are.
Dr. John Campbell, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. Now, we're about to be joined uh, by the most popular medic that I've known on television or radio because he talks clearly and he doesn't hide from the political and economic backdrop to this or, for that matter, many other health issues. Health cannot be separated from the rest of society. It's not something that exists in a bubble. If, uh, if uh, an economy, if a society is not taking care of people's health, is not properly investing in its health system, then people are going to get sick, not just from the coronavirus. And I'm glad to say that Dr. Ranjit Bra, NHS consultant, physician and vascular surgeon, joins me now by Skype. Of course, uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ranjit. Nice to see you. I hope you're uh, still uh, healthy. Um, but of course, a lot of people that were healthy last week are not healthy this week. How, how does it all look to you so far? Pleasure to be with you, George. Thanks for having me on again. Um, again, it's been a week with many uh, and rapid changes. So as you say, I'm a vascular surgeon uh, and m my practice is very much affected, but I'll start perhaps not talking about my practice, but those of my colleagues. I think the people who are really on the front line are those who are in our accident and emergency services, nurses and doctors, those who are in our, in our intensive care units, nurses and doctors, our anesthetic colleagues who are increasingly being repurposed and recruited into anesthetics as our, uh, sorry, our, our ITU care settings and emergency care settings, uh, as are a lot of our general medical colleagues and even some of my surgical colleagues as well. The NHS is doing its absolute best to repurpose itself using the tools it has at its disposal. But I've been in touch with many friends and colleagues that I've made over my 20 year training and career uh, within the NHS, up and down the country and the picture they're painting, I, I was on uh, a Turkish channel invited me to be on, I'm sure they must have seen me on your show, George, I'm otherwise an unknown figure really. Um, uh, they invited me on and I was privileged to be on with uh, Roberto Caselli, who is, a, who is a professor of intensive care medicine and he's there at the heart of the epidemic in Italy, in Lombardy. Um, and I'll come back to a couple of points he made in a second. Um, but he pointed out uh, that this is fundamentally different from other viruses because there's still a lot of talk that this is simply the flu. And there's a lot of talk, and, and it was a point that I kind of made when I first started talking to you, the numbers are small and comparing it to flu. But the, the fundamental difference I think that we have to appreciate between this virus and the flu is the fact that it does cause this severe acute respiratory syndrome. It does cause this, what he termed, Professor uh, Caselli termed, uh, a viral pneumonia, which is a, a good way of looking at it. And it's that which makes it so deadly. And although we know it spares, relatively speaking, the younger population, already I've spoken to colleagues who have been caring for people who are presenting with this virus, extremely short of breath, unable to breathe for themselves, who are as young as 20 and 30 and having to be intubated. If you look at the intensive care data that's coming out of the patients who have been admitted for intubation with this care, their average age is about 55 to 60. Not old, George. And, and, I, and I bring these points up, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm saying things that are not unknown to your listeners, but there's an undercurrent. I think it's, it's very strange for many of us to be restricted in our movements, restricted in our homes, locked down. We feel it's a relatively oppressive regime, though I think on the whole it is through persuasion that it's being maintained, but we can come back to some of the um, new legislation that's been enshrined around the coronavirus, because I think that's important as well, and possibly undermines the effort to actually persuade the public. Um, but it's different because you know it's, it is extremely dangerous. And perhaps 10% of the patients who catch it will need hospitalization, and perhaps 5% of the patients who catch it will need ventilation. And that leads us to look at the figures of how this has taken off. While in Wuhan, in China, the numbers have now really plateaued. They're genuinely static. And there are some fantastic documents and videos that are released to show 
just why that is, you know, the incredible public health measures we've mentioned that they've managed to successfully put into place. But that is not the case for the world. For the world, this is really going into you know, an absolutely exponential phase. So there are 700,000 cases around the world. But of course, those are the cases that have been tested and that we know about. There will be many, many more. And of those, 32,000 have died. That means on a world scale of the total cases, and, and many of those do not have an outcome yet, people are still unwell. Of the total cases, we know that already 4% have died. That's a, that's a huge figure on a world scale. And if you look at Italy, you're looking much closer to 10, 11% of the confirmed cases have died. Now that's a huge mortality figure. When I first spoke to you, we wanted to compare this pandemic in particular, or, or perhaps I did as a useful re way of referencing it, the 1918-19 flu pandemic, the Spanish flu so-called. That had probably a mortality rate of 2% and caused 50 million deaths worldwide. The, the population of the world is much more dense now. If we were to, to assume that 80% of the population did get, uh, the world population really did get this virus and it's spreading very rapidly, um, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. That would be, you're talking then, about 150 million or more people dying. And, and I really do think we have to say they're dying because of this virus, not just simply with this virus. Yes, we know that people who have com comorbidities are more at risk, um, but I think we would have to clearly say that this virus is lethal to those people who catch it. Well, look, I'm... Uh, uh I'm powerfully moved by what you say, but there are a lot of people, actually they're beginning to drive me nuts, uh, who say that this is all, I don't know who they've got in mind uh, that has persuaded you, me, uh, Vladimir Putin, President Xi, uh, and so on, uh, what Western propagandist, uh, what uh, closet fascist who wishes to uh, create a new world order, uh, uh, or, or all the other uh, ludicrous uh, allegations that are uh, thrown. This is bloody serious, Ranjit. It, it, it absolutely is, George. And, and I think it's an interesting um, undercurrent. I think partly we have to say our own governments and their initial responses to blame. They were very, very keen when this first happened to use it for cheap propaganda point scoring against China and somehow say that this was China's fault. But imagine if the entire leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, say their central committee had come down with coronavirus, you know, President Trump, uh, our own leaders, Boris Johnson, if he's still leading the government, uh, now that he, uh, Chris Whitty, and of course, uh, our health minister, uh, Matt Hancock, all came down with coronavirus within 24 hours. Um, uh, they would have had an absolute field day. But, you know, the fact that this is spreading throughout our royals, throughout our MPs, throughout our government shows you how widespread it is. I mean, I do think it, it, it brings up a point about testing, that why is it that celebrities, royals, MPs are being tested? Why is it the royals are being told it's OK for them to go to their second home to protect them, whereas the general population are encouraged to stay, if they're lucky enough to have a second home, in their first home. You know, this is something that affects different people of different economic brackets very differently, but it is very real and working people need to take it seriously. Of course, when our government initially said they were gonna take it on the chin, let it run through the population, and all they did apparently to repair was lay down emergency legislation, which is draconian and is repressive because it has such measures as no more than two people should be allowed to meet, that people can be detained for 24, 48 hours without any reason, that it gives unlimited ministerial power. So all of these are incredibly draconian measures that do arouse hostility and suspicion amongst wide sections of the population, particularly when large numbers of working class people are anyway alienated from the government because I don't believe that our government has their best interests at heart. So for all of those reasons, and, and, I, and I watched Peter Hitchens, someone who, whose politics are very different from mine, who are very different from yours, but sometimes does take a courageous and independent stand against the prevailing orthodoxy of uh, normal propaganda, normal mainstream media. He was a get, spoke out quite powerfully against the Iraq war, for example, and therefore has his own 
following and a certain gravitas. I heard him speak on talk radio. Talk radio even had invited me to speak a few weeks ago, very briefly on their news. Um, so so I, I heard him speak and and it was interesting. He quoted, he does quote sources. He does read, he does think. He's quoted, for example, a German immunologist. And, you, and, I, and I went and I had a look at a little YouTube interview with that German immunologist who pointed out that in Germany, their mortality rate's a lot lower. It was 0.03. In fact, it's catching up. It's coming up to 0.7, which is as low as China got it with very good health measures. And it may be that Germany has a much higher incubation, uh, um, a rate of intensive care beds and general acute beds, and it has more ventilators. It has about you know, eight times as many ventilators as the UK. It may be that they never have such bad mortality figures as the UK, because in the UK already we know we have 20,000 cases. I fear it's much more than that. If you see the way it's spreading through wards, spreading through hospitals, spreading through the healthcare population, I know, for example, that one quarter of the um, ambulance staff in London are, are off sick, self-isolating. Of course, we don't absolutely know whether they have the disease or not because they're not being tested. And Matt Hancock, or in fact, it wasn't Matt Hancock. So even so, when when the when the government and the uh, uh, the A team, if you like, went down with COVID, they did actually for the first time wheel out Simon Stevens. So Simon Stevens, who is actually the de facto, the real head of NHS England, the chief uh, chief officer of NHS England, um, and he made an announcement that they were doubling the testing by next week. But still, our testing is woefully. Inadequate. There's been signs that they've, uh, our government has secured um, 3.5 million tests. If you have a look at where those tests are, they've not reached the front line. Some people are starting to be tested, but overwhelmingly, frontline nurses and medics haven't been tested. Don't know, therefore, whether they have the symptoms. Don't know whether it's safe for them to work. So these are the aspects of our response which are not joined up. You know, which are which have led to people thinking. To be honest, they can't take it very seriously. If you see the social distancing that's happening in China in areas where they genuinely were concerned and have locked down, because they didn't lock down everywhere, they did rigorous testing, rigorous contract, contact tracing, encouraged people to self-isolate, tested people three or four times to make sure, one, they had the virus, and two, then were clear and negative before they're allowed to go back into society. So strong measures, strict measures, but appropriately guided and targeted measures through a population who are, who are trusting of their government because they know their government has their best interests at heart. And in, in a government that was able to mobilize the resources, uh, you know, the economic resources, the health resources of the entire country to deal with the problem and didn't have to reckon, if you like, with the, with the furies of private interest. Our government has been able to, and, and we must say they have put measures in place, but it, it's largely a massive bailout. There's been a huge economic crisis and crash, which we're kind of distracted from slightly by our unusual physical conditions of being locked in the house. But a third of the value of the stock market worldwide was wiped out within the course of a week. There are massive you know, implications for that, um, which will be long-term economic problems. And, and that the underlying epidemic, you know, which is not one of just the coronavirus uh, in a, by itself, it's the underlying ep epidemic, if you like, of poverty and inequality. And that means that it's very different for me, who, if I'm locked down, I have a house and I have a garden and my wife is at home with me and we have kids, but we will look after them and we have food. You know, we found that there are three to four million children who, despite the lockdown, are having to go to school every day in order to take their food. So not being properly isolated from the risk of the virus and will carry on spreading the virus precisely because actually they're food insecure. You know, we have so many people in our own country, the fifth richest country on earth who are insecure. Imagine what the situation is going to be like in proper third world countries where there really is not the health infrastructure to test or treat people. I know, and I'll, I'll just give one brief example of India. My father is Indian. Currently he's staying in India. Um, Modi there has been praised by some for locking down the country. I, I normally would be very skeptical of, of praising Modi. And now when I'm seeing how that lockdown is being enacted, I'm see I'm right to be skeptical. Working class people in India work hard for small amounts of money and they migrate all across the country. With the lockdown, those large working class communities are have been cut, chucked out of their, their, their jobs, a lot of them in construction, a lot of them in agriculture. They've lost their wages. 
They've lost their ability to feed themselves. There's no transport. They've been told they have to go back to their ancestral villages, sometimes halfway across the country. So they're migrating, you know, all over the country. And of course, India said they've got less than a thousand cases. And that, what that really means is that there've been very few tests. My one hope is that what we're see what we're seeing with our proven tested cases are the extremely sick end of the spectrum, who are turning up in hospital disproportionately unwell well compared to those who have mild disease and are not being tested. But the only way that we'll really know that is when we roll testing out on a much wider scale. And three and a half million tests, I, I hope those will really be, be seen on the front lines. But much like the PPE crisis, and there really is a crisis of personal protective equipment because one, this virus is much more infective than normal bacteria, which is what we, the infections that hospitals normally deal with. We haven't ever tried to stop the cold passing from person to person because it's not a very severe infection. This is more infectious than the cold and a lot more deadly. So it is very hard to contain. And you, those kind of pictures from Lombardy, pictures from Spain, pictures from China that we've seen of that very full protective gear is what's needed, particularly for exposure prone procedures, endoscopy, well, that, surgery. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, words fail me uh, that uh, uh, the sixth richest country in the world with a seat on the United Nations Security Council, uh, a nuclear armed military power doesn't have enough personal protection equipment for its own health staff. Dr. Ranjit, thanks as always. I hope you'll come back next week and I hope uh, we'll have some better news, though unlikely that seems. Thank you very much indeed for coming back on the show. Sean says on Twitter, it's hard to tell how the government did. We'll find out in the weeks to come. And Jamenta says, uh, the same thing. Tommy says, do you think the coronavirus may push us into a cashless society? I see that's one of the tropes currently running. Who cares? I've actually no interest whatsoever whether the pound in my pocket's got the Queen's head on it or her backside on it or whether I have to spend on a plastic cart. Really, if you think I've got people writing to me saying that there's helicopters up in the sky. They're spying on us. If you think the government needs a helicopter above your street to spy on you, you need to get out more. And if you think that a cashless society is going to be uh, in any sense different from a, a, a cash society, I just want people to have more cash, whether it's in plastic or paper. Uh, Joe says, in Italy, Lombardy specifically, if you die of leukemia in hospital and you test positive for COVID-19, even post-mortem, which they are doing, your death is caused by COVID-19. George, I work at a printing company. I'm on zero-hour contract with an agency. The company I work for declared themselves essential. All the staff are disgusted that we have to put our lives at risk so they can make money. And email from Martin, forget COVID-19 for a minute. The burning question is what happened to your Yorkshire tea mug, George? <laughs> the person that looks after it never came in. Thanks very much. Let's take a break. Tess uh, on the line in Wales, what could happen? after the pandemic. Tess, are you there? I'm here, George. How are you doing, mate? You're right. Okay, go ahead. What would you like to say? Yeah, basically, you just said it. What, where, where, oh, where are we going with this? You know, where do you think we're going to end up after this is all over? I mean, if it ever is all over, that's another question entirely. We could, we could have another pandemic afterwards, perhaps. I mean, it amazes me that the PPE thing, I've been listening to your callers, and it's a banging show tonight, you know, and then... Um, guests and callers talking about PPE, that, that's the biggest thing for me, really. It's the most visible evidence of the utter failure uh, of, yeah. uh, of our governments over decades, because this didn't happen uh, since Boris Johnson came in, didn't happen since David Cameron came in. Uh, we, yeah, we've always we, had um, health and safety we, executives 
getting well, more and more health and safety executives on it for years. And, yeah. and you can't go on site without a hard hat, well, but you can yeah, go on site with a Exactly, exactly. <laughs> We've got, so we're, 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 gonna... we're health and safety conscious in society as a whole, except for our frontline <laughs> doctors and nurses dealing with yeah, right highly infectious diseases. That, that yeah. frankly, doesn't compute. So who is responsible? It's a systematic responsibility. If you, if you decide you are going to have a society where the public realm is impoverished, is made shabby, is deteriorated, is sold off its best bits uh, to uh, private concerns, uh, then when an epidemic comes along, a pandemic comes along, you're going to be bold for six. And uh, the reality is uh, that the, uh, both parties, Labour and the Conservatives, have been either uh, more publicly or more covertly uh, complicit in this degradation. Our public services have been degraded. They've been degraded in every respect. The salaries of the people who work in yeah. them, degraded. The equipment that they've got to work with, degraded. The buildings in which they have to work, degraded. The honor and uh, respect given to the people in those services, degraded. And loads of money. A guy working on a computer screen, shouting, uh, buy, 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 sell, 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 on the floors of the supermarket is sold to us as a real economy, as a real success, and it seriously is not. Tess, are you still there? Unfortunately not. Troy McCulley says uh, social distancing is nonsensical. Tell you what, Troy, why don't all you flat earthers gather yourselves together? You could do it online and then arrange a place to meet, preferably you know, Dartmoor or Exmoor or Glencoe, somewhere absolutely remote. Why don't all you flat earthers go and have a convention? Why don't you have a march? You can march up and down uh, some desolate area. You can fraternize with each other. You can hug and kiss each other. You can even have sex with each other. You can exchange bodily fluids with each other. You can breathe on each other. Then we'll see if social distancing is nonsensical or not. Duruti, 1936, says it's not as bad as the Black Death of the 14th century, the Great Plague of the 17th century, or even the Spanish flu at the end of World War I. Still awful, but don't exaggerate. Well, it's only just started, Duruti, so how come you're so confident that, for example, it is not as bad as the Spanish flu of 1918 and 1920. Dr. Ranjit Brar, who probably knows a little bit about more, more about medicine than you do, Duruti, I'm inferring that you're not a doctor. You may be, in which case, if you are, I apologize. But Dr. Ranjit Brar made a comparison with the so-called Spanish flu uh, not half an hour ago. And who are you to say uh, that that's wrong? It might, it might, it might, I pray it won't. Maria Richmond says, if you don't want COVID-19, don't go outside. Leave the rest of us alone. I'm not sure what that means, Maria. So the rest of you are outside getting COVID-19. Is that your point, Maria? Chief 0174 says, very naive is Gigi. Does he not even know Bill Gates has the patent? Hysterical fool. Tell you what, Chief, why don't you and Troy McCulley get together for a meeting to discuss that? How Bill Gates set this pandemic going. How Bill Gates is planning on killing and has already killed thousands of people. Why don't you? Why don't you go and have a meeting, you and Troy, and possibly Maria Richman, go and have a meeting 
about this. Christopher in Berkshire is back on the line. He's had the virus. Let's hear from him. Christopher. Hello. Can you hear me better now? Yes, better. Uh, I okay. want to ask you how quickly you fell ill and how long it took you to feel better. Well, I actually have a history on that, but I'm just trying to be as short as possible here. But basically, from a normal cough, which is it was like 5 o'clock at night, to 1 a.m., I had my lungs almost shut down, and I, I, I couldn't breathe, basically. And, I mean, I can't even explain to you. The, the, I've never felt like that. I've been through a lot of illnesses in my life, in terms of just general flu. But this is something, and I'm 28 years old in peak condition. So I don't smoke. And for those that out there that think that this is a joke, uh, what can I say? I mean, people, basically what I think is people, the change and the, and the danger is coming too quickly, too much, that the human mind cannot adjust to the reality that that is. That's the problem. Yeah. I think that's right. Uh, and, you know, our leaders, political leaders, corporate leaders are so bereft of credibility, uh, so disbelieved uh, by the population, hated even uh, by the population that anything that they say must be disbelieved, that anything that happens is a conspiracy. And Bill Gates is often found at the center of that conspiracy. For some of them, Jewish names leap into their minds and find their way into the triptych of conspirators. It's a very sad state of affairs. Christopher, thanks for coming back on the line. Edward is in Vancouver. Let's hear from him. Edward, go ahead. Hey, George Galloway, uh, just great. Uh, like always, uh, respect your opinions and speaking truth to power. So thank you. I wanted thank to get you. that out there. And lovely Vancouver. I've spoken there many times. I love it. It's one of my favorite cities. Go ahead. Uh, well, one thing I just wanted to say is I, I agree definitely with the previous caller that this is a very serious thing. Uh, I'm 30 years old and I think I've had it as well. And I've been struggling with it for almost two weeks to get over it. So. Uh, for anybody that's tra listening and downplaying it, it's definitely a serious situation. So for immunocompromised people and elderly people, you know, to get this thing, it would definitely be a very bad situation. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention, I wanted to hear your thoughts on what coronavirus would mean for the Palestinians. Um, you know, I read this one article that basically said that Gaza has 40 ICU beds for two million people who are under siege. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on what you think about what, uh, what's going on well, in uh, Gaza. I, I think that's uh, a very specific case, but there's a general issue also. I'll deal with the specific case first. The people in Gaza are, are in an open air prison. It is nothing more or less uh, than that. Uh, there's uh, no entry and no exit. There's no entry for the means of life. There is no exit for the desperate uh, in need of treatment abroad. Uh, the people there, two millions of them, as you say, are absolute prisoners in an open air prison surrounded by barbed wire. They have nowhere to go, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, either from the airplanes or the shelling from the sea, or the shelling from land, or the coronavirus. They have uh, almost no intensive care uh, beds. They have almost no ventilators. Israel has just taken delivery of a given number uh, of ventilators, and it distributed to the West Bank a grossly, disproportionately small number of those ventilators. So far as I know, it has distributed none uh, to Gaza. So Gaza and the West Bank are facing catastrophe in this non-existent virus that some people are talking about and mailing me about. But it's true also of the poor world 
in general. Uh, I didn't see it, but my wife was watching an item on the screen the other day, yesterday, about self-isolation in a township in South Africa. How do you self-isolate when six of you live in one room, in a shack? How do you wash your hands regularly and thoroughly when you have no access to clean water? How do you live as close to a sterile life as you can when you have no proper sanitation or sewage? How do you watch your diet when you have no money with which to eat? How do you phone 111 when there is no 111 and when you have no phone? How do you get intensive care treatment in a hospital that isn't there and when there has none of the paraphernalia of which we speak here in developed countries. So this is a, a profound uh, point, Edward, and one which we haven't even really begun, but may have to uh, confront. The Egypt, for example, the teeming millions of Cairo, the millions of slum dwellers in Egyptian cities, if, when, the coronavirus sweeps through Egypt. How biblical will the cost be? Thanks, Edward, for that call. Poll number two, what's the first thing you'll do after it's over? A, uh, meet your extended family, 38%. B, go to the pub, 37%. These are not mutually exclusive, of course. You could meet your extended family in the pub. 25% of you, though, and I'm proud of you, will as the first thing they do after this is over, we'll give thanks to God in prayer. 464 people have voted on that. You've still got time to change that balance uh, on my uh, Twitter feed. Matt is in Suffolk. He wants to talk about the homeless. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, George. Uh, good to speak to you. Um, you. I've been a long-time listener, um, big fan. Thank you, sir. Um, Thank you. And, and I want to thank you for the work that you do. I, I, I think, um, to be honest, I really, really appreciate it, and I'm sure a lot of other people do too. Thank you, Matt. God bless you. Thanks. Um, what I wanted to ask you about, really, was to get your opinion on something that um, I picked up on in the news today, um, which I haven't heard anybody else talk about yet. And that is the fact that um, the government have said the councils, the local councils, need to take in all of the homeless people yeah, on the streets. In, yeah, in hotels, yeah. Um, so uh, the way I read it was that basically we have just solved homelessness in the UK overnight. Uh, temporarily, yeah, because the hotels will reopen again. But uh, yeah, I take your point. Yeah, so uh, my point is um, people have campaigned to help the homeless for years. Um, people have donated millions and millions over the years um, since, you know, way before my lifetime and probably will continue after my lifetime. Um, so why is it that we can take these people in and sort them out because of the coronavirus, yet in the normal scheme of things, mm. uh, no, nobody seems to sort of give a damn, really? Well, that, that's the society we live in. That's the way of the world in the world we have. It's not the one either I or you would uh, design, but it's the world we've got. Uh, and the, the short answer is because the health of the poorest person in Britain today uh, is capable of affecting the health of the richest. Uh, if a poor homeless man coughs, uh, that cough can spread this virus all the way to Buckingham Palace uh, or wherever Prince Charles lives wherever Boris Johnson is currently residing. You see my point. It was never more true uh, that we were all in this together because the health of the weakest has the capacity of affecting the 
health of the strongest. So that's the first reason why they have done it. The second reason is that there is now capacity uh, f for them to do it. There are hotels that are closed, boarding houses that are closed, and therefore these, uh, these uh, rooms would otherwise be empty. The government is paying the local authority to pay the hotelier and the boarding house uh, owner. It's not a long-term solution, but you're right, it proves that there can be a solution just like that. Richard in Manchester thinks Boris Johnson's doing a good job with the virus, so we better hear from Richard. Go ahead, Rich. Hi, George. Not Hi. very often I disagree with you, but uh, I think that this guy is doing a phenomenal uh, job for the country. Yeah. You remember, I, I loaned him my vote, and he came on and said, thank you very much for the loan of the vote. He's been doing exceptionally well. I know you might disagree with me. And then, of course, this coronavirus comes on, and everybody's taken the opportunity to kick him. And uh, I don't agree with it. They always say, and I'm sure you know this saying, never kick a man when he's down. And I think as from Turkish poor background, like yourself from Scotland and like myself from Manchester, I, th I think we learn a lesson. We get tougher, we get stronger. And I don't think he's put off that everybody calls him a clown. I heard Campbell... Uh, Calling him a liar, a liar, a liar about 12 times on the... On Campbell the... called him a liar, my God. Talk, yeah, yeah. talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Exactly, 11 times with John Burko, you've got to see it. He's, uh, and, and to be fair to Burko, he didn't call him a liar, but, but Campbell did it 11 times, George. Anyway, I, I thought I'd just say that um, our Messiah, uh, Mr. Blair, uh, was on this morning. Oh, he's back, how, yeah, he's back. People are asking. Uh, people are asking where's Sir Keir Starmer. I don't know, but I, I see that Tony Blair's back. <laughs> well, if Keir, Keir Starmer comes back, we might as well have Tony Blair. Exactly. Yeah. Keir, Keir Starmer is Tony Blair without the laughs, without exactly. the, without the pizzazz, without the polish. But you probably haven't had it, uh, seen it today, but you've got to see it. And um, it, it, he's saying about, oh, the Ebola uh, virus uh, in, in Africa, we cured this, uh, the Tony Blair Institution. And I'm in touch with um, every uh, leader of every nation in Africa. And then you look at South Africa, and I felt like saying to him, because I've been like you, to South Africa. And to see the poor people there, and I'll tell you what, George, we've got nothing to worry about here. Uh, we, honestly, I could cry for the people down there. They're going to be really sick, and they've got nothing. They've got absolutely nothing. And here's Blair with his 200 million, his 75 million pounds worth of assets, his private jet at 10,000 pounds a time, his Tony Blair institution. I'm not, I'm not even jealous of a penny that he's got. But I tell you what, these people like Heseltine, these people like Blair, these people who went against us. You remember that three and a half year war we had to get out of the European Union? I don't hear any of them saying, oh, I'll come forward. You would, George, if you had 200 million. You'd be up in Scotland, you'd be saying to everybody, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do the other. Not boastfully. But these guys just come up and all they're thinking about themselves. They never mention anything like the poor people. It's all me, 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 and money, money, money. And I'm sorry to go on a bit, George, but no, I feel no. very... You've made a, you haven't persuaded me that Boris Johnson's doing a great job, but you've made a powerful telephone call, a powerful case, just the same. Thanks, Richard, in Manchester. Uh, a legend's on the line. It's Norma in Bristol. Norma, go ahead. Hello, George. Are you staying? Um, are you staying safe? You and your husband? Yes, we are. We're, we're, we're very well looked after. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Um, this coronavirus, coronavirus, isn't it? Yeah. It's so worrying. But George, I got two very different comments. Um, one is about the Excel Centre. Yeah. Um, every year, you know, it hosts the um, exhibition for buying and selling of weapons including, like, we sell our arms yeah. to Saudi. It's and always, now... It's, a, it's always been a hall of death. Well, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. I mean, now the Excel Centre, sad though it is, worrying though it is, may have to deposit dead bodies there, you know. It's just a comment that I sort of thought no, about. No, it's a really uh, uh, powerful uh, comment. Um, and I, I could hardly believe my eyes when I saw them setting up this one-kilometer-long 
whole as a mark. Uh, unless they're being uh, alarmist, unless they're being pessimistic to the point of uh, dread, are we really going to need all that morgue space? How many more people are dying on a daily basis now uh, than died on that day last year? The answer is about a third more. However, if you took the average of the last five years, there are fewer people dying in Britain at the moment than died across that average of the five years. The problem is if this keeps on escalating, isn't it, Norma? The problem is if 1,000 becomes 2,000, becomes four, becomes six, becomes eight, that's the problem. That's when you're going to need the Excel but Center, George, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I, I, mean, I get... I get quite nervous, really. The, and this is a diversion from stress now. Yeah, good. Okay? I need one. I need one. Yeah, this is it. So this week, we've uh, seen two very, very old-fashioned films. One was made in 1938, and that's the year of my birth, and one was in 1944. Now, one was called The Lady Vanishes, and I don't suppose you've seen it because you're too young. No, I have seen it. It's a great film. It's yeah. It was Margaret Lockwood and Michael Redgraven. It was a thriller. And the other one, which we saw this afternoon, is Jane Eyre, with Joan Fontaine and a young Orson Welles. Wow. And it was very old-fashioned magnetic romance with over-dramatic music in the background. And, George, we enjoyed it, and it's relaxing. Ah, well, I'm going to watch it on your recommendation. Have you got Netflix, Norma? No, no, that was just... We, no, we, we recorded it from yesterday. OK. I think it was on... I, I don't quite know when I was it, just going to. I was yeah. just going to recommend two things to you and to the audience. First of all, you must check out Bob Dylan's first new song for, I think, at least a decade, nearly a decade, anyway. Uh, it's called Murder Most Foul. It's uh, 16 minutes long, and it deals with the murder, the assassination of Jack Kennedy in 1963 and goes through the 1960s. It is absolutely spellbindingly beautiful. You must listen to Bob Dylan's new song, Murder, Moth, Foul. And the second thing, but you need Netflix for this, you need to watch Babylon Berlin. It is a, quite a long series. Amazingly, Brian Ferry pops up on the stage, performing live in the middle of the series. It's set in 1929 at the fag end of the Weimar Republic. You'll thank me for the recommendation. I hope to make a series like that out of my own novels, Queensway, still available on Amazon or directly from me at George Galloway. Dot com info at georgegalloway.com I wish I could play out with Bob's new song uh, but I can't it's been marvelous for me I hope it was for you and if it was come back next week at the same time to the same place and bring somebody else with you good night <laughs>